I'll pretend I'm smaller. Thank you. What a tour de force. Um, given the situation in the world, I changed my paper. Sorry. It's called In the Act, The Shape of Precarity. And I think there's a lot of conversation, or perhaps a lot of conversation. I begin with a quote by Peter Pelbart, Peter Paul Pelbart. And this uh, text that I quote from Peter Pelbart was the text that he gave at Guattari's funeral. In a text on Guattari, Deleuze speaks of two Guattaris, a Pierre and a Félix. He was called Pierre Félix. According to Deleuze, one was, quote, like a catatonic head, a blind and hardened body perfused by death when he takes off his glasses, end quote. The other, quote, a dazzling spark, full of multiple lives as soon as he acts, laughs, thinks, attacks, end quote. These are the two schizophrenic powers of an anti-eye, the petrification and the spark. Shortly after Felix Guattari's death, Peter Paul Pelbart, schizoanalyst, philosopher, wrote a text that he ended with an anecdote about Guattari's inherent doubleness, wanting to get at the complex overlapping in Guattari of what Deleuze calls petrification and spark. The anecdote recall, recalls a trip taken to La Borde, the clinic where Guattari worked and lived. Pelbart writes, In 1990, passing through France, I went to visit the La Borde clinic with Guattari. We left Paris by car. He asked me to drive, and while I was driving, he slept, like that, without his glasses, petrified, as Deleuze describes it. It is well known that sleep can confer on the sleeper the guise of a rock. But the next morning, awake, Guattari hadn't changed. I had never seen him this way, even during his many trips to Brazil. To escape from a situation that made me a bit uneasy, I decided to go out and walk with my partner. Guattari wanted to accompany us. We walked in silence. It was late afternoon. We listened to the noise of our steps and faraway sounds. Every evening was coming. A neighbor greeted us. Everything was bucolic. And then we found ourselves in front of a pigsty, in silence. So I tried to converse with the pigs using my limited knowledge of oinking. Slowly, the dialogue became more animated, and Guattari began to participate in the conversation. He laughed a lot, and he oinked a lot. I think that in this day and a half spent at La Borde, this was the only conversation we had, oinked in front of the pigsty, with a collective of pigs in a veritable becoming animal. I left the next morning troubled. I told myself that a thinker has the right to remain catatonic, to become dead, to oink from time to time, if it please him or her. To tell the truth, since that day, I never stopped envying this catatonic state. Sometimes of my own accord, I find myself this way, to the distress of those around me. Later, in rereading some of the texts, I understood that his silence at La Borde was not only a petrification, but also an immersion in a kind of chaosmosis the mix of chaos and complexity, of dissolution, where what is to come must be engendered. One, depression. In his work on the alignment of depression and capital in neoliberal times, Bifo Franco Berardi uses the figure of Guattari, with whom he collaborated when he was also a committed activist, to explore the relationship between depression and the act. Focusing on Guattari's so-called winter years, Bifo wonders not only at how depression affected Guattari's work as a philosopher and activist. Bifo suggests that Guattari's depression not only left him paralyzed in the face of life, but put him in a situation wherein he gave himself to causes that he didn't really believe in. Depression, it seems, not only affected Guattari's capacity to be in the act, it transformed his ability to direct his energies in ways that would best move his practice forward. 
This inability to demonstrate volition with respect to what was most important to him, activism, Bifo argues, is in part tied to Guattari's own reluctance to discuss the relationship between activism and depression. Bifo explains, I sensed and was convinced that in the final decade of his life, Guattari had at several points undertaken a political commitment in which he did not deeply believe, that is, seeming to him to be his duty to, quote, hold on, that he needed to get past this rather difficult, regressive period, etc. And I perceived a kind of exhaustion in his will to maintain a position. So in this phase of the Guattarian itinerary, what seemed to me to be missing is a reflection about depression. While one would need to enter more fully into this concept, depression basically is a disinvestment of libidinal energies in facing the future, in facing the world. Naturally, it's a question of a pathology, but not only that. Or rather, in short, the pathology is not something to be undervalued. Bifo, in a move that troubles me, then returns to Guattari's writings to explore the omission of depression. In what seems to me a classic psychoanalytic gesture, Bifo analyzes Guattari's work to see how or why depression was excluded. Turning to Deleuze and Guattari's writing on desire and anti-Oedipus, he writes, Felix did not pay attention to depression, neither as a philosopher nor as a psychoanalyst. And we can easily understand why. The methodology or démarche of the anti-Oedipus is not easy to reconcile with the possibility of delving into depression. Depression is not, is not just a condition among others in which a machinic unconscious is assembled, made of existential and chaosmotic fragments proceeding from anywhere to everywhere else. The anti-Oedipus does not know depression. It continuously overcomes, leaping with psychedelic energy over any slowing down and any darkness. Personalizing Guattari and making the dangerous assumption that writing is an act that should somehow mirror the writer, Bifo continues his analysis. Felix knew this, I'm sure, but he never said as much, not even to himself. And this is why he went to all these meetings with people who didn't appeal to him, talking about things that distracted him and making lists of deadlines and appointments. And then he would run off, adjusting his glasses to consult his overflowing daily planner. And here again is the root of depression in this impotence of political will that we haven't had the courage to admit. Using his friendship with Guattari as a guarantor, basing his account of Guattari's mental state on what went on between them as friends, Bifo undertakes a specious project. Specious because based on a proposition that uses the personal as the central figure, instead of acknowledging at the very outset Guattari's lifelong investment in the pre-personal and the group subject. Bifo backgrounds the operational nature of Deleuze, of Guattari's and Deleuze and Guattari's writing, when Bifo, uh, of Guattari's writing, when Bifo suggests, for instance, that the writing on the machinic unconscious is only about, quote, a continuous overcoming, that the writing refuses, quote, any slowing down and any darkness, he misinterprets, it seems to me, the machinations of desire as outlined in Anti-Oedipus. Anti-Oedipus is not an account of light over darkness, but one of the in-act. The in-act is not positive or negative, it is productive. This is Deleuze and Guattari's definition of the desiring machine. Depression is not missing from anti-Oedipus. The complexity of neurodiversity is everywhere present in the account of what schizoanalysis can do. What's absent is a separating out of depression from neurodiversity as a whole. Anti-Oedipus foregrounds transversal operations that propose techniques for creating desiring machines that are capable of cutting through existing systems to create new modes of existence. Psychoanalysis is one of the systems Anti-Oedipus's desiring machines cuts through. Anti-Oedipus works against any account that would re-stratify a neurotypical identity politics or any normative identity structure. For theirs is an exploration avant la lettre of what neurodiversity can do, not of its failings. To suggest otherwise would be to discredit the force of schizoanalysis so central to Guattari's practice. 
Guattari would resist, it seems to me, any normative account of depression that would situate it in the agency volition intentionality triad. When Bifo speaks of Guattari's inability to use his time well, he provides exactly this kind of normative account of depression. He proposes that Guattari demonstrates a lack of volition, suggesting that in the best case scenario, Guattari would have had the kind of will, the kind of agency that would better direct his decision to align himself to projects that matter. Guattari would also be suspicious of an account of depression that kept it within the bounds of the subject. He would be more likely to align himself, it seems to me, to the following account of depression that, unlike Bifo's analysis, refuses to situate depression solely in the individual, making it a collective problem for which a group subject must be invented. This is a story narrated by Andrew Solomon, who has written widely about his struggle with depression. In this story, Solomon recalls a trip to Senegal where he experienced a ritual for, for depression called Nadup. The Nadup is a ritual practice that involves the careful crafting of techniques to create a group subject. As with all rituals, certain precise procedures have to be followed. Solomon explains. The first thing we had was a shopping list. We had to buy seven yards of African fabric. We had to get calabash, which was a large bowl fashioned from a gourd. We had to get three kilos of millet. We had to get sugar and cola beans. And then we had to get two live cockerel, two roosters, and a ram. These effects were purchased at the market, except the ram, which was, brought by the, which was bought by the side of the road. Then Solomon headed to what would, uh, to what would become a full-day ritual. By early afternoon, the ritual really got going. And I quote, and the sound of drumming began, the drumming I had been hoping for. And so there was all this drumming, and it was very exciting. And we went to the central square of the village, where there was a small makeshift wedding bed that I had to get into with the ram. I had been told it would be very, very bad luck if the ram escaped, and that I had to hold on to him, and that the reason we had to be in this wedding bed was that all my depression and all my problems were caused by the fact that I had spirits. In Senegal, you have spirits all over you. The way here, you have microbes. Some are good for you, some are bad for you, some are neutral. My bad spirits were extremely jealous of my real-life sexual partners, and we had to mollify the anger of the spirits. The entire village had taken the day off from their work in the fields, and they were dancing around us in concentric circles. And as they danced, they were throwing blankets and sheets of cloth over us, and so we were gradually being buried. It was unbelievably hot, and it was completely stifling. And there was the sound of these stamping feet as everyone danced around us, and then these drums, which were getting louder and louder and more and more ecstatic. And I was just about at the point at which I thought I was going to faint or pass out. At that key moment, suddenly, all the cloths were pulled off. I was yanked to my feet. The loincloth that was all I was wearing was pulled from me. The poor old ram's throat was slit, as were the throats of the two cockerels. And I was covered in the blood of the freshly slaughtered ram and cockerels." End quote. After a short break, the ritual continued. Solomon was told to place his hands by his side and to stand very straight and erect. They proceeded to tie him up with the intestines of the ram. He continues. In the meanwhile, the ram's body was hanging from a nearby tree, and someone was doing some butchering of it, and they took various little bits of it out. And then I had to kind of shuffle over and take these little pieces of the ram and dig holes and put the pieces of the ram in the holes, and I had to say something. And what I had to say was actually incredibly, strangely touching in the middle of this weird experience. I had to say, spirits, leave me alone to complete the business of my life and know that I will never forget you. And I thought, what a kind thing to say to the evil spirits you're exercising. I'll never forget you. And I haven't, end quote. Solomon continued to speak this mantra. He was then given a package of the millet with which his body had earlier been rubbed and told that he should keep, sleep with it under his pillow that night. 
He was also instructed to bring it to a beggar, quote, who had good hearing and no deformities the following morning. Once the millet had exchanged hands, he was told, quote, that would be the end of my troubles. And he continues. And then the women all filled their mouths with water and began spitting water all over me. It was a surround shower effect, rinsing the blood away from me. It gradually came off, and when I was clean, they gave me back my jeans, and everyone danced, and they barbecued the ram, and we had this dinner, and I felt so up. I felt so up. Solomon's participation in the ritual places in the ritual places us in a completely different relation to depression's workings than does Bifo's account. A Rwandan who encounters Solomon several years later articulates this difference succinctly. After hearing of Solomon's experience in Senegal, this man says, You know, we had a lot of trouble with Western mental health workers who came here immediately after the genocide and we had to ask some of them to leave. The problem was that their practice did not involve being outside in the sun, like you're describing, which is, after all, where you begin to feel better. There was no music or drumming to get your blood flowing again when you're depressed and you're low and you need to have your blood flowing. There was no sense that everyone had taken the day off so that the entire community could come together to try to lift you up and bring you back to joy. There was no acknowledgement that the depression is something invasive and external that could actually be cast out of you again. Instead, they would take people one at a time into these dingy little rooms and have them sit around for an hour or so and talk about bad things that had happened to them. We had to get them to leave the country. This is the key detail Bifo's analysis of Guattari's winter years misses. That all of Guattari's theory and practice emerges from the necessity to bring out the collective resonance of the event. To see illness not as a personal problem to be analyzed outside of the field of relation, but as an event, an ecology that necessitates the kind of minor gestures that populate the ritual described above. Minor gestures that tune the event to its more than as outlined so comprehensively in Anti-Oedipus, the force of schizoanalysis is that it creates the conditions for opening the event to its productive schism, rather than reducing it, as psychoanalysis would do, to a regressive account of a past pre-constituted. Time in schizoanalysis is of the event in the group subject of its co-composition. Any technique created in the name of schizoanalysis needs to be able to craft event time, to move the event to an operative more than that persuasively cleaves it within the installation, Suryu argues, is at the heart of the creation of new modes of existence. In his years of practice at La Borde, Gotari was everywhere involved in the creation of such techniques that activate the ecological core of experiences more than. In his writing, where chaosmosis, as Palbart suggests, is probably the strongest description of the force of petrification and spark, Guattari aligned himself again and again, not with pathologizing accounts of neurodiversity, but with the kinds of rituals described above, rituals that involve bringing out the community, rituals that activate the minor gesture, rituals that transform the very grounds of experience. Two, neoliberal depression. Bifo's argument over the last decade is that neoliberalism has left the body disempowered, our collective nervous system besieged by the forces of capitalist takeover. And I hope this is clear that, that, um, that this is a problem many artists face. Yeah? Okay. We can and indeed we must no longer act. As outlined by Gary Janosko and Nicholas Thoburn in their introduction to Bifo's After the Future, Bifo argues that, quote, activism is the narcissistic response of the subject to the infinite and invasive power of capital, a response that can only leave the activist frustrated, humiliated, and depressed. Activism, Bifo suggests, is a desperate attempt to ward off depression, quote, but it's doomed to fail and worse, to convert political innovation and sociality into its opposite, to replace desire with duty. 
Bifo sees the current landscape of depression as, quote, a product of the panic induced by the sensory overload of digital capitalism, a condition of withdrawal, a disinvestment of energy from the competitive and narcissistic structures of the enterprise. And it's also a result of the loss of political composition and antagonism, end quote. Depression is the collective effect of a social tendency as, quote, born out of the dispersion of the community's immediacy. When the proliferating power is lost, the social becomes the place of depression, end quote. In the past, autonomous and desiring politics were actively co-composing, whereas now, in neoliberal times, such proliferating power is lost and the act, activism, is incapable of resurrecting it. It's difficult not to see Nietzsche's last men rearing their heads in this dark account that has so, complete, so completely lost the élan of the inact. Quote, the earth has become small and on it hops the last man who makes everything small. His species is ineradicable as the flea, the last man lives longest. Nietzsche. This is certainly not Bifo's hope nor is it what moves his writing, but I wonder whether the account of depression he proposes doesn't end up cementing a reactive nihilism, a cynicism that tends, despite its notion, its position against, to strengthen the status quo. Being out of act, out of service, isn't that the very, uh, isn't that the very posture of ressentiment? Despite my respect for Bifo as an activist and thinker, and as a friend. I hope to challenge Bifo's account of depression, and particularly his account of the relationship between depression and activism. I will do so by paying close attention to the story told by Peter Pelbart of the chaosmosis at the heart of the not-me, which is inhabited at once by petrification and spark. Taking the act not simply as that which is in the service of the neoliberal economy, but more broadly as the force of the event through which minor gestures course. In taking depression out of the context of an individual sadness, I want to explore the operative passage between petrification and spark. In doing so, I do not want to discredit the fact that there is extensive turmoil in the face of neoliberalism's excessive takeover of what a body can do. There is no question that these are troubled times. Nor do I want to suggest that depression isn't terrible. It is. What I want to do, always with the Nadup ritual in mind, with its belief that depression carries a more than that needs to be attended to in its differential force, with its, uh, with its acknowledgement that it is only collectively that new modes of existence can be invented, is proposed that depression operates in event time not outside the event in a passive relationship to the what was. If we start here, the inquiry leads somewhere profoundly different than the path Bifo outlines. Against Bifo's account of the neoliberal takeover of the act, this different path leads us toward a rethinking of the inact, as I've, uh, as I've attempted to do elsewhere through Whitehead, a rethinking that leads to a neurodiverse exploration of what else, what else is at the heart of experience. In my own struggles with depression, it has become clear to me that what we call depression is nothing if not plural. It expresses itself in an infinity of ways from sadness to hunger, from loss to anguish and anxiety, from a frenetically quiet inner panic to a full-fledged panic attack, from the stillness of a body incapable of moving to an agitated body. For some, all of these tendencies are present which leads depression to be less about a state that could properly be described than a terrible decalibration that makes it impossible to compose with the world. Everything feels out of sync. This is the case for me. The experience is one of not being able to connect to the movements that surround me, not being able to match their rhythms. The best description of this is a sense of misalignment with time. The world moves too quickly or too slowly in ways that are difficult to connect to. It is as though there were multiple speeds and slownesses in continuous unalignable disjunction. Medicated and with many years of various kinds of treatments, the sense I have 
is that it has become easier to align and that the field of relation now stabilizes enough to allow a co-composition across worldings. I can participate. But the one who participates is not a personalized I. It is a schizo I, like Deleuze's account of Pierre and Félix. A schizo anti-I in the sense that there is no absolute integration, but instead an emergent potential for co-composition across experiential time, both quick and slow. Living with depression and acknowledging the necessity for facilitation in its many relational guises, what has emerged through this art of participation is a belief in the world as a mobile site to which alignments are possible. These alignments are not given, they must be crafted. Opening the way for a co-composition that potentially aligns itself to times in the making requires, I believe, a rethinking of the act of alignment itself. It requires what Guattari would call a group subjectivity, an account of a collective that exceeds the personal. And to connect with this collectivity in the making, it requires techniques for inventing modes of encounter, not simply with the human, but with the wider ecology of worlds in their unfolding. For the collective as a mode of existence in its own right is not the multiplication of individuals. It is the way the force of a becoming attunes to a trans-individuation that is more than. To become collective is to align to a chaosmosis in a way that prolongs the capacity of one body to act. This is not to underestimate the pain, the difficulty, even the horror of depression, nor to underplay how complex misalignments make us feel our silence on the one hand and our anxiety on the other as signs of our decalibration with the world. Nor is it to argue that drugs against depression in its widest definition should be handed out as liberally as they are. It is simply to inquire across my own experience and through the moving readings of Peter Palbart's account of Guattari's petrification, how else we can facilitate emergent collectivities without turning to the neurotypical habit of pathologizing difference or, in the case of depression, of too quickly aligning the non-volitional to passivity. Three, neurodiversity. It is very common for autistics to suffer from the disabling anxiety that is on the spectrum of what is treated as depression. And I should say here, if you're not familiar with my work, that my work has been in collaboration with autistics for the past decade or so. It is also very often asserted by autistics that they have a strange sense of time. Quote, time perception in autism spectrum disorder is a part of the complex of the condition Many people with autism experience fragmented or delayed time perception, which can present, present challenges to social interaction and learning." End quote. What I want to do by aligning the autistic's perception of time to the perception of time in the wide array of depressive disorders is not to suggest that we are all autistic or that all autistics are depressed but to turn to neurodiversity to think about the complexity of experience. By focusing on the concept of autistic perception, a term I have defined as the capacity to directly perceive the field of experience in its unfolding, I want to explore how depression, as the experience of time's differential, is itself on the continuum of autistic perception. And I've talked about autistic perception as defined by autistics as the um, inability to directly chunk experience. So when they come into an environment, they talk about the environment taking time to come into itself. And they say that neurotypicals are chunkers. You could understand that as, as uh, that neurotypicals categorize, um, but even at the level of perception itself, so that when we enter into a room like this, neurotypicals uh, can see chairs and pianos and desks and computers and it can take up to five minutes for an autistic to perceive that. But of course if you're familiar with, uh, with any, any kind of, of work on perception you also know that so-called neurotypicals um, take time to chunk. It's just a much quicker process. Autistic perception is a direct experience of relation, a worlding that makes felt the edgings into the field of experience. 
This makes it difficult for autistics to have a strong sense at any given moment of a time separated out from the event time of their perception. Makes it very difficult to cross streets and do other such things. Metric time, time counted, is often difficult to sense, let alone predict. Of course, autistic perception of time varies as much as there are autistics. But there are some salient characteristics. For instance, those on the spectrum, quote, experience a delay in how they process certain stimuli, including time. It can sometimes be hard for them to comprehend that hours have passed. For example, a person with autism who has echolalia may hear a phrase in the morning and repeat that phrase hours later out of context. Another quote, anecdotal reports suggest that individuals with autism have trouble gauging how much time has passed and parsing the order of events, end quote. Speaking of her autistic son with ADHD and wondering where the two conditions meet, Emily Willingham similarly emphasizes a strange sense of time. Quote, one area of overlap is their sense or lack thereof of time and timing. They both show delays in responding to spoken questions or requests. When their peers learned to tell time in elementary school, they were completely at sea, unable to instinctively comprehend the passage of time. Even now, in their adolescence, the question, what day is it, is frequent, as is, what are we having for lunch, within an hour of having had lunch. Within depression, a similar sense of the untimely is at work. Steve Connor writes, People with severe depression have a disrupted biological clock that makes it seem as if they are living in a different time zone to the rest of the healthy population living, aside, living alongside them, a study has found. Personal account supports this research. Quote, when I am depressed, I feel like time goes slowly, yet at the same time, I feel like I or anyone else has hardly had any time to live at all. It feels as if time is running out. Another quote. Yes, days go, back, go past slower and more boring feeling, like everything's going to drag on. On the other hand, I feel like life, going, life is going too fast and the years are flying by and I start getting depressed thinking, there's not long to live now, etc. Another quote. You cannot remember a time when you felt better, at least not clearly, and you certainly cannot imagine a future time when you will feel better. Being upset, even profoundly upset, is a temporal experience, while depression is atemporal." End quote. If autistic perception is the direct perception of experience informing, it is also, as I suggested above, a direct perception of time, but not metric or measured time. It is the direct experience of, time, of the time of the event. Event time is experiential time, time felt rather than abstracted. It is the time of the oinking in Peter Pelbart's story. It is the moment in its alignment to itself, to its unfolding. It is not time in the sense of a pastness that can be recorded on the present. It is the now felt in its entirety, in its untimely infinity. And so it passes too slowly or it moves too fast, oscillating in a time always of its own uneasy making. Four, language. When experience resists external organization according to a matrix of time, the linearity of language's enunciation is invariably affected. The experience is that of words blurring, of the impossibility of composing a thought that will survive articulation. As I've discussed elsewhere in relation to auti type, which is uh, what is what the what they name the kind of language where the autistic is facilitated in their communication. For the autistic, especially the one on the classical end of the spectrum, where motricity is affected such that vocal cords cannot be properly located to permit speech, or where impulse control makes it difficult to direct speech toward what the autistic wants to say, language comes slowly, finger by finger, on the keyboard. But it also comes slowly experientially, moving around images that are closer to metaphors or metamorphoses than direct statements. As autistic Larry Bissonnette writes, quote, typing is like letting your finger hit keys with accuracy. Leniency on that is not tolerated. M easily language impaired. Art making is like alliance people develop with their muscles after deep massage. He's an artist. You can move freely without effort. 
Shifting in and out of autistic perception, language comes in fits and starts in a time all its own. Watching Chami communicating in the film Wretches and Jabbers, a film that follows two autistics, Tracy Thresher and Larry Bissonette, in their travels to meet autistics in India, Japan, and Finland. And all of these are classical autistics, which means they work, they, they type, they can't speak. We see a familiar, we see a familiar scene. Chami types one letter at a time, with his mo while his mother facilitates not only by touching him, but also, as is often necessary with facilitated communication, by vocally encouraging him to continue when he becomes anxious. One sentence is typed, and then Chami pushes the chair away, runs into the next room, waves his fingers in front of his face, vocalizes. For someone unfamiliar with autism, it would seem he has completely lost interest in the conversation. But soon he returns to his chair where, out of the frenzy of the movement, another sentence is typed. When asked about why he needs to move around like this, Chami types, killingly hard to figure out the pattern of movement I need to type my thoughts. Mm. Movement makes time, m makes time felt. It activates the field in its emergence, making felt how space-time composes with the time of the body, in the bodying, and in this case, with the time of language. But let us not forget that the time of the body is doubled, petrification and spark, on a spectrum that is precarious at both ends. As I have done elsewhere, I'd like to think of the time of the body and the moving as the shape of enthusiasm. Elsewhere, I've talked about this in relation to Fernand de Ligny's work. Think the shape of enthusiasm not as a, person, as a personalized body that is enthusiastic, but as the experience of bodying that shapes the event and is shaped by it. The shape of enthusiasm is itself a spectrum that swings in an oscillation that moves from the potential energy or the energy in waiting of petrification to the expressive, potentialized energy of the spark. The shape of enthusiasm gestures toward the more than in the event at both ends of the spectrum, foregrounding how the inact is operational both in its initial activation and in its coming to be as this or that. This is an enthusiasm, a chaosmosis, not only with life already engendered, but in the very act of engendering. At the petrified limit, an enthusiasm held in abeyance, absolute movement, energized potential. At the exuberant limit, an enthusiasm fully expressive in the moving. Chami's frenetic movement between sentences foregrounds a bodying that takes the shape of enthusiasm, a bodying here attuned to and in excess of the articulation of words. This is shaping that defies description, at once anguished and exuberant, frenzied and ineffable. Movement here is itself expression, expressionability, not a deviation from language, but its extension, its co in co-composition. As Chami's coming to words through movement makes clear, language is in the moving, in the shape of an enthusiasm that lingers precariously both on the side of anxiety, worried that communication will prove impossible, and on the side of a kind of overpowering Spinoza's joy which cannot contain within itself the measure of language in its linear representation. In a post entitled The Obsessive Joy of Autism, autistic Julia Bascom writes, one of the things about autism is that a lot of things can make you terribly unhappy while barely affecting others. A lot of things are harder, but some things, some things are so much easier. Sometimes being autistic means that you get to be incredibly happy and you get to flap, you get to perseverate, you get to just have about the coolest obsessions. It's that the experience is so rich, it's textured, it's vibrant, it's layered, and exudes joy. It is a hug machine for my brain. It makes my heart pump faster and my mouth twitch back into a smile every few minutes. I feel like I'm sparkling. Every inch of me is totally engaged and empowered up by the obsession. Things are clear, it is beautiful, it is perfect. Being autistic to me means a lot of different things, but one of the best things is that I can be so happy, so enraptured about things no one else understands, and so wrapped up in my own joy that not only does it not matter that no one else shares it, but it can even become contagious. This is the part about autism I can never explain. This is the part I never want to lose. Without this part, autism is not worth having. 
The words just can't do it on their own. The feeling, the carrying feeling, which is what autistic Lucy Blackman calls it, is just so excessive, the quality of its shaping too exuberant to be formulated. Hence the rhythm of autotype, its force of the metaphorical, the metamorphical, a mobility that dances before it signifies. Depression in its alignment to anxiety petrified is not without vitality affect, nor is it without movement. It is as uncontainable as the spark of its opposite and as precarious. But its quality is different, and with this difference come different effects, for its shape is always closing in on itself. Direct perception of moving, movement moving is hampered. It's like walking in molasses. If the shape of enthusiasm is the tremulous field of expression itself, its exuberance, depression is the field's calcification at the limit, where expressibility is closest to foundering, especially when called on to order itself into a linguistic articulation. There is simply nothing to say. But there is something to oink. The conversation not yet mapped out, the opportunity to body, to sound, to express in a collective voicing that has not yet been organized is available. And it is this that Peter Pelbart hears that afternoon at La Borde. And it is also this, I believe, that we often hear in the words that align to autistic perception. For the spectrum that precariously balances between petrification and spark is extraordinarily mobile in its tending to one or the other extreme. And perhaps especially so in autistic conversations where each word, each letter typed is a reactivation that must relocate the otherwise dislocated multiplying body. If you've never seen autistics type, it's slow, right? So every letter has to then be, the, the whole process has to be reactivated for every letter. So this does not happen at this speed. Citing Anne Donnellan, Ralph Savarese writes about the challenge autistics experience in, quote, staging the customary relation of the senses and body parts, which must subtly cooperate to produce the seamless integrity of neurotypical functioning. The tricks that autistics employ to compensate, touching something to make sight usable, for instance, reveal the necessary relation. There are no discrete faculties. As the drive to pattern links distinct entities through a process of visual or auditory comparison, the equivalent shows up in language through a practice of touch-based typing. Touch literally coordinates thought, and not just any kind of thought, rather sensuous relational thought." End quote. Language comes relationally and remains relational. The process of facilitated communication, as I've suggested elsewhere, only emphasizes that what is everywhere only emphasizes what is everywhere the case. To act is never to act alone. Facilitation takes many guises. For those whose body refuses to organize itself, it acts as an organizing force. It quote coordinates thought and not just any kind of thought, rather sensuous relational thought. For there is nothing more frustrating, I'm certain than when, quote, ladle of doing language meaningfully is lost in the soup of disabled map of autism, Larry Bissonnette. Facilitation opens this, quote, disabled map of autism thanks to a, quote, potholder of touch. And in the mix of thinking, feeling, become writing, the poetic voice of Audi type emerges, caught always between petrification and spark. Five, schizoanalysis. The schism between expression and enunciation, the intense passage between petrification and spark, the shape of enthusiasm that bodies, these are schizoanalytic tendencies. Or said differently, the schizoanalytic, the non-I of the double which expresses itself as the schizoflux in anti-Oedipus can be felt in the bodying forth that composes at the edges of language where the movement of thought is most active. Schizoanalysis composes with autistic perception. Autistic perception, as I have suggested before, emphasizes a modality of perception shared by all, but felt directly by so-called neurotypicals only under certain conditions. Depression is one of those conditions. Exuberance is another. In these conditions, what is felt is the precarious edge of existence where experience is under transformation, where the field of expression still resonates with its own becoming. 
Falling in love is an example of an event where the shape of enthusiasm overtakes what is thought of as the boundedness of the subject to foreground the opening, the opening the field of relation provokes. The deep silence of depression where the world seems to be enfolding or the inner anguish of anxiety where speeds and slownesses seem to be out of sync with the world at large, these are also events where the relational field vibrates and the sense of a preconstituted self falls away. This state of vibratory composition where self and other are not yet and where the categorical does not take precedence is very much what Deleuze and Guattari describe as the eventful field of potential. This field of potential is not embodied by the personalized schizophrenic. As they repeat throughout Andy Oedipus, their interest is not in this or that schizophrenic. Quote, someone asked us if we had ever seen a schizophrenic. No, no, we have never seen one. But of a schizoid pull in the social field, over and over they emphasize that schizoanalysis is not about the production of a schizophrenic, but about the schizophrenic process. Of course, Guattari worked daily with schizophrenics, but not with the schizophrenic, not with schizophrenia as a general idea. Indeed, all of the therapeutic techniques at Laborde emphasize the singularity of a given therapeutic event. There was no generalized therapeutic matrix. This is what Deleuze and Guattari emphasized throughout Anti-Oedipus. Schizoanalysis reinvents itself through each of its desiring operations. It cannot be contained or described. It is always in the act. This attention to the difference between the schizoid pole and the production of the schizophrenic as an individual is similar to the distinction I make between autism as a medical category and autistic perception. I'm not making a value judgment on autism when I describe autistic perception, nor am I suggesting that all of autism can be subsumed under its mantle. Rather, I am drawing attention to a perceptual tendency that seems to be extremely pronounced within the autistic community and also present in each of us who figure elsewhere on the spectrum of neurodiversity. This perceptual tendency reminds us that there is no preconstituted body that stands outside the act of perception and that objects and subjects are eventful emergences of a relational field in emergence. Schizoanalysis, as Guattari emphasizes in an interview after the publication of Anti-Oedipus, quote, introduces into analytic research a dimension of finitude, of singularity, of existential delimitation, of precariousness in relation to time and values, end quote. Unlike psychoanalysis, it does not seek to, quote, discover the unconscious, but asks instead to, quote, produce its own lines of singularity, its own cartography, in fact, its own existence. And it does so not through the individual, as I've said before, but through the pre-personal force of the group subject, a collectivity through which experience becomes multiple. To bring to it the language of autistic perception is to emphasize how the schizoanalytic process foregrounds the becoming multiple in an emergent ecology of the shape of enthusiasm. Not this body, this experience, this identity, but a collective field effect of relationscapes that map themselves out according to emergent cartographies that exceed this or that subject or object. Experience makes itself felt as multiple, and it is out of this multiplicity that an account of its effects can be expressed. Like the conversation with the pigs where the force of the oinking exceeds one person's voice or even one person's idea of what constitutes a conversation, the becoming multiple of experience through the group subject allows a fractured, complex, and excessive field of communication to emerge. This field resists interpretation, and it cannot be explained away. Schizoanalysis is a practice that reorients itself continuously around the intuition of a problem in the Bergsonian sense. What a body can do is its mantra. We cannot, we must not attempt to describe the schizophrenic object without relating it to the process of production. Always linked to desire, also in the mode of production, schizoanalysis taps into the force of a bodying that shapes experience into its exuberant potential. Exuberant not in its attachment to a subject, but exuberant in its chaosmosis in the force of its expression across the precarious chasm of petrification and spark. A productive material intervention emerges that takes the site of expression as, an ex as exemplary of what it does, not what it fantasizes. The goal is not to locate the symptom, what happens, as Whitehead might say, 
happens, and it is how its effects resonate that makes a difference. Not what you think you see, but how the seeing materializes and what it does. So you don't perceive chairs, sit on the ground instead. The face doesn't form, follow the light effects. Writing refuses to come linearly, mobilize the words in the moving. Stand, run, jump, wave your arms, huddle, vocalize, whatever it takes. Because this is where the thinking happens. This is where language resides, a language that does not need to come out in words, a language in the bodying. A language in the bodying takes the shape of enthusiasm. It shapes desire in the moving. A truly, quote, a truly materialist psychiatry can be defined by a double operation, introducing desire into the mechanism and introducing production into desire. So now I'm going to skip a section where I talk about the relationship between schizoanalysis and desire um, and, and, um, and go back to Bifo's analysis uh, for lack of time. And I'll end on um, a final section that talks about activism. I'll read just a few lines first that end the section just before. Anti-Oedipus remains a revolutionary book, and a current one. What I haven't quoted here is that at, at a certain point in, in his book, Bifo says that uh, uh, the time of Anti-Oedipus is over, that it is no longer relevant to the, the times in which we live. Taking the force of desire as its mantra, it speaks not of pathologies that are disabling, but to the very potential of moving away from what Guattari calls normopathy. It's amazing what a group of depressives can do. Just watch the news. Demonstrations are happening everywhere. And with each of them, we see a reorienting of modes of existence that challenge the neoliberal politics which frame our existence. Mobilizations like the one in Turkey may begin to save a park, but very soon they are about political reform, about neoliberal dominance, about new forms of life living. And this is not an isolated case. In the 2012 Montreal student strike, we saw a similar emphasis, not on discrete demands, but on a wider rethinking of what it might mean to learn to live and to live well. This, it seems to me, discredits Bifo's suggestion that, quote, the global movement against capitalist globalization reached an impressive range and pervasiveness, but it was never able to change the daily life of society. It remained an ethical movement, not a social transformer. It could not create a process of social recomposition. It could not produce an effect of social subjectivation, end quote. For BIFO, it, if demonstrations do not produce something recognized as, as a different social system, they have made no difference. What about the what else of the inact? What about the unwieldy effects of their continuing activity? Doesn't the separation between the ethical and what BIFO calls, quote, a social transformer, Miss the point of the desiring machine, which I've just skipped over, that cuts to recompose? Sure, the effects have not been felt in every corner of daily life, but they are felt. A change can be felt in the post-strike classroom in Montreal, in the students' commitment to study and to what Fred Moten and Stefano Harney call the undercommons. A chain can, change can be felt since the wave of Occupy movements. A change can be felt across America in the wake of Ferguson. Are things rough? Yes, absolutely. It's been a hard year for activists. Neoliberalism strangles potential every day. But new techniques for life living are also being invented every day, activated by minor gestures that continuously transforms, transform what it means to act. In the final section, six, activism. In a bid to do away with activism, Bifo writes, the term activism become, became largely influential as a result of the anti-globalization movement, which used it to describe its political communication and the connection between art and communicative action. However, this definition is a mark of its attachment to the past and its inability to free itself from the conceptual frame of reference it inherited from the 20th century. Should we not free ourselves from the thirst for activism that left the 20th century to the point of catastrophe and war? Shouldn't we set ourselves free from the repeated and failed attempt to act for the liberation of human energies from the rule of capital? 
Isn't the path toward the autonomy of the social from economic and military mobilization only possible through withdrawal into inactivity, silence, and passive sabotage? End quote. I would like to address Bifo's remarks through a return to Wretches and Jabbers, the film I spoke about before, turning to a few scenes where conversations about activism take place. Shortly after having arrived in India in dialogue with Chami, Larry types, I think we are big time movers making a difference in people's lives who can't talk. The words don't come easily and Larry has to fight a meltdown to get them out. But he still finds a way to turn the conversation to what is most important, the activist movement for neurodiversity. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with neurodiversity, it is an activist movement that um, refuses the, the logic of care in relation to mental illness. I mean, sorry, cure, <laughs> not care. Uh, a similar encounter happens in Japan. Naoki, a prolific autistic writer and artist who lives in Tokyo, runs up and down the stairs and seems to jump off the walls before he can sit down to write. But then the words come without pleasantries, immediately addressing the urgent questions at hand. From Larry to Naoki, quote, mobilize letters like patterns of thought, like proud autistics we are. No time for small talk, every word and effort, writing, thinking is in the act. And necessarily so, for the stakes are clear. Tracy, who travels around the world with Larry and their facilitators, does not at the time of the filming have a home. Living conditions for autistic adults are extremely precarious. Despite the fact that he serves on two state level advocacy committees in the US, he depends on people who are paid to take care of him and wonders every day whether he will be able to continue to afford to pay them. In the United States, as in most societies, the funding for autistics runs out at age 18. And yet, his commitment to neurodiversity is unwavering. Depression, anxiety, the agony of difference, these all remain. But they are not decisive in the way Bifo suggests they are. Rather, they are productive, expressive of the multiplicity of experience out of which the movement for neurodiversity composes. Quote, let's begin the world's intelligence magnified organization, Tracy types in conversation with Naoki and Larry. In Finland, a similar encounter occurs. In their first conversation, again without preamble, Antti, who spends his days in a care center folding towels and doing other kinds of busy work, types. I'm interested in talking about our current experience, how we have changed as people. I think now is a good time to bind the strings of friendship between us strong people who will pass the message." End quote. Later, Tracy adds, we are a perfect example of intelligence working itself out in a much different way. In the act, the force of activism, of activist philosophy, is not about the individual. At its best, it is about how the collective operates as a group subject. This is what resonates in wretches and jabberers, not despite their anxiety, their unwieldy oversensing movements, their depression, but with this difference in the shape of its enthusiasm, because of it, in the urgency of expression that is spoken in images that pull us into the movement of thought. Larry, Chami, Tracy, Naoki, Anti, and, and amongst other autistics, DJ, Tito, Emma, Ido, and so many others feel they have work to do, and they are doing it. Many of these autistics are very young, 12, 13, 14 years old. This again, not despite the exuberant, frustrating, excessive, deactivating, joyful interruptions to the flow of words, but with, in the act. Despite, desire is revolutionary, not when it is individualized or turned against itself, as in Bifo's account of depression, but when it creates differential effects. Quote, and if we put forward desire as revolutionary agency, it is because we believe that capitalist society can endure many manifestations of interest, but no manifestation of desire, which would be enough to make its fundamental structures explode. What is revolutionary is not the act in itself, but the opening of the act to its ineffability, to its more than. When the more than is explored in its effects, a schizoanalytic process has begun. This process, as Deleuze and Guattari demonstrate, is not a method, nor is it a therapy in any conventional sense. It is an emergent attunement to the precarious range of petrification and spark, attuning toward both the frenzied vocalizations of the autistic and the rock-like silence of the depressive, who may inhabit one and the same bodying. There is no hierarchy here. 
just a set of productive effects from the disarray of a field in motion. The purpose is not to organize or select, but to make the way for something else to emerge, a collective oinking, an engaged discussion, a mobile patterning. From here, new modes of existence begin to take form. Neurodiverse modes of existence must be created, and they must compose across difference in ways that remain mobile in the act. Pathology is not the answer, nor is methodology in research creation, by the way. Co-composition across the spectrum is necessary, as much between the precarity of the shape of enthusiasm as its two poles on, uh, at its two poles as on the spectrum of a collective difference, autistic or not. For we all have access to autistic perception, and we are all susceptible to falling into depression. For those of us for whom autistic perception comes less quickly, less easily, perhaps, as I've suggested before, it's time to learn to chunk less, to refrain from quick categorization. This will likely not end neoliberalism, but it will continue the engaging process of inventing what life can do when it composes across collective utterance, collective resonances that listen to dissonance. Bifo writes, we have today a new cultural task to live the inevitable with a relaxed soul, to call forth a big wave of withdrawal, of massive dissociation, of desertion from the scene of the economy, of non-participation in the fake show of politics. Wouldn't such a task be the very recipe for the kind of depression Bifo forecasts? To act must not be overlaid with capitalism's call to do, to make. In the act is something different altogether, precarious, but creative. Not creative of capitalism's newest new, but creative, as Whitehead would say, of new forms of value, of new ways of valuing modes of existence in their emergence and dissolution of new alignments to the time of the event. The challenge to maintain the schism between the inact and the act. Systems are quickly formed, as are our habits of existence. And if these systems, these habits, reorient toward the individual in the mode of the preconstituted subject, we can be sure that there will be a deadening of the operations of the movement for neurodiversity. But this isn't where I think we're headed. I prefer to listen to the autistics named above, most of them young adults, for they reassure me the inact is where the joy is, where the minor gestures tune experience to its more than, where activity is not yet dedicated to a cause or to an effect, but open for the desiring. Thank you so much, Henning. And, uh, well, I think what I, strikes me in both presentations is, is first the, Nick Wilson's strong warning to avoid any kind of building a transcendental frame of uh, Deleuze Guattarian space that we should relate to. It's a warning against stratifications. I think this is very crucial at the start of this conference. And Edin is just uh, showing us how things have evolved and developed so, so quickly, so significantly. And we, didn't, we are in a world that uh, uh, transcendent <laughs> uh, what Deleuze Guattari could have imagined, imagined in a certain way. And so all these new problems, of which artistic research is one of the things I think Deleuze could not uh, anticipate, the emergence of this field as it is now. So, and you are bringing all these uh, new dimensions, new ways of, of relating to temporality, for, struck me very much, to relate to our dialogue on music, for example. Uh, and uh, so I think I'm extremely happy with this beginning. We have time for one or two questions, if there are any, to conclude the panel. There is one question there. Please identify yourself and uh, make the question. <laughs>
So I, I've written a lot elsewhere about uh, techniques uh, for research creation and, and um, I chose not to talk about them today because, because of the way the world is going and the urgency I feel in relation to the question of how action is possible. But what I take to be at the heart of research creation is uh, what one might call speculative pragmatism. I don't work theoretically in that sense that I impose philosophical work onto practice. I work with people. The autistics that I work with are not Kantian, I'm sorry to say. And if you don't know uh, autism and you think that their structures are about structuring, they're not. Autistics organize in order to manage the incredible proliferation of autistic perception. And in this proliferation of autistic perception, they compose the most extraordinary work. Um, in this text that I gave today, I gave just a little window. But if you'd like to know more about what I've said about autism, I've written two books about it. But, so I can just say that I, I have a certain impatience with questions that want to situate philosophically in a way that proves one theory or another. I am not interested in that. What I'm interested in is what anti-Oedipus is doing. What, what can it do today? I'm interested in what a person who I also respect, like Bifo, what, he's, what his thinking can do in this political moment, or what it can't do in this case. What it, and I'm interested in what a movement for neurodiversity, which is, I think, the most interesting current activist movement, which is, I mean, where are you gonna find an activist movement, movement with five-year-olds? I mean, it's an extraordinary movement. What it is doing to put us on the spot and to say to us, where do the important things begin? Because if artists can't do that, then, I mean, I, I have no words for that. And the neoliberalization of the artist in the university and this importing of theories by the artist onto their work is what we have to, at all costs, fight against, in my opinion.